Thanks, Ashley. Um, everything's sharing and I'm sounding okay and everything? Looks great, sounds great. Fantastic. Okay, so uh, yep, my name is Kieran O'Leary. I'm the Digital Preservation Manager with the National Library of Ireland. Um, I'm delighted to be here and I want to thank the organizers for accepting the talk and for their wonderful work in continuing to put on the conference in spite of the difficult circumstances. Um, what I want to talk about today is, if I can move my slides along, um, I want to talk about moving out of an AV specific career um, into working in a national library, dealing with a much more general portfolio of digital objects. Um, I'm going to touch on why I think this topic was worth talking about to begin with. I'm going to talk about kind of glam and AV as a bit of a vocation. I want to discuss uh, standards, skills, and tools, and how they facilitate these kinds of career moves, and some of the similarities and differences that I've noticed. Um, so, seeing as my talk is kind of about moving from the specific to the general. When reflecting on this conference itself, um, it also strikes me how specific No Time to Wait originally was. Uh, at least the original headline was focusing on the use of FFE when Matroska in archives. And I even remember on the last day of No Time to Wait 1 that the idea of there being subsequent events was seen as kind of funny because it was felt like everything that could possibly have been said about FFE when Matroska was already said. Here we are. Um, the next conferences were on the um, intersection of open media, standardization, digital audiovisual preservation. And I wonder if perhaps no time to wait will eventually move away from being AV focused into maybe more general digital object preservation, but let's see, and probably doesn't even matter. So I thought initially that my talk today was about transferable digital skills, but I think that it's probably as much about standards as anything else. Um, so I've always found that my yearly trip to No Time to Wait was quite invigorating, giving me extra energy to complete the year, start new work. Um, and I was worried that there would no longer be a place for he, me here now, that I'd moved away from an audiovisual role into something that was far more general, dealing with things like the preservation of like documents, spreadsheets, organizational records, uh, the born digital collections of uh, Irish writers and digital photographs. And down the road, we'd be dealing with email collections and things like that. So it might be really obvious to people that it's okay and easy to jump from AV to more general media like this, but whether it's imposter syndrome or something else, I for one thought that it would be difficult, if not impossible, to ever leave AV. I think that one of the main reasons for this is probably like, I don't have a formal qualification in libraries or archives. And I think a lot of folks find their way into moving image archives because they might have a specific like industry-based skill, whether it's being a colorist or having experience with physical film, an editor or something like that, and then you might end up diversifying as you get in there and you have a love for it. But anyway, now that I've been away from AV for close to a year, I've generally found that things aren't all that different, I guess. So as I'd spent about seven years, um, initially as an actual physical film archivist, and eventually becoming a pretty specialized digital audiovisual preservationist, for want of a better term, I kind of just assumed that I was in this career for life. Um, perhaps I might focus more on software development, but even then it would still very much be in an audiovisual context. And we often hear of kind of um, gallery, library, archives, museum work as a vocation, but I think it's probably especially true for AV, where, and you know, when you uh, deal with things as a vocation, you can end up being a victim to the love that you have for the work. Uh, depending on your country and situation, you could end up potentially with low pay, uh, poor benefits, perhaps little career advancements, but sacrificing a lot of that for doing something you love so much. And one, I guess, very illuminating and maybe depressing thing that I've learned from the time to wait over the years from talking to people is the quite shocking low wages in some major institutions, which is particularly painful when you see the extraordinary love and skill displayed by the staff. It's sometimes hard to describe the love and attachment relating to the preservation of the moving image. But I think anyone who's spent any time in a film archive, maybe laced up 16 or 35 mil in a Steam Deck for the first time, seen some Kodachrome uh, home movies, or maybe less romantic, but still, the first time you held a crew drive in your hand, uh, performed a validation, and loaded up a DCP, there's a certain kind of magic there that's very, very hard to walk away from. And I think that your skill set just ends up getting more and more specific over the years. I definitely found that for myself when I started to move into digital audiovisual preservation. Um, I think that one of the first times that I considered properly leaving was when I saw that the National Library of Ireland pop up on a bunch of major Irish news websites and uh, on Twitter when they were announcing their very first born digital uh, acquisition, which was material relating to the novel The Mystery of Mercy Close by Marion Keyes. 
it instantly uh, resonated with me and I had instant kind of FOMO. Uh, I had a rough idea of what something like this might entail, you know, multiple chapter drafts, uh, supplementary material, dealing with all sorts of potential puzzles, uh, building up workflows, digital forensic works and stuff like that. And I also, I guess I knew some of the staff that were working on this, specifically Jerry Wilson, Della Keating, Joanna Finnegan, Maria Ryan. And it just felt like it was a great team that were striking new ground because the National Library of Ireland is over 140 years old, existing long before the formation of the Irish Free State. Yet this was the start of a new era, uh, born digital collecting. So I ended up here and realized that all of the born digital collections so far have been incredibly unique. They have their own issues, but thankfully the AV skill set crossed over really well. Uh, mostly because of, I guess, the nature that I was, of the nature of the work that I was doing in the um, Irish Film Institute. So I guess there's many ways to reuse the skills of the audiovisual, um, the digital audiovisual archivist, but I think it's especially possible if your work has incorporated as many standards as possible, uh, preferably open standards, because this is no time to wait after all. So uh, the obvious one to me is OAIS. I'm sure there's probably people rolling their eyes when they hear me say OAIS. Um, but still, um, my slightly cynical feeling on OAIS is that I feel like maybe it's referenced in presentations and policies more than it's actually read. Um, I know it's probably very cynical, but still, when I see it referenced, it's often the famous functional model diagram, which I just personally haven't found to be terribly helpful. Uh, the information model, though, which describes information packages, is a pretty useful benchmark, benchmark <laughs> for conceptualizing your digital objects and metadata uh, and finding potential gaps. And it was one of the very first things I did when moving to this new role was to write a report on how we currently conform to the information model, what might be missing, what could be improved, especially when moving from focusing on digitized material into the born digital realm. And for those of us who end up with like quite a fragmented archival information package where the, the data is split across various systems and not just everything's in a single bag in a file system, it's quite a useful exercise. And one thing I really like about um, when you look at the information model is that there's a bunch of things there, like even if we forget about people in the digital realm, but like traditional archivists dealing with paper, like there's bits in there about provenance, uh, context, access rights, descriptive metadata, that I think there's a nice little bridge, bridging of different elements of uh, memory work. Um, so I'm a big fan of this model for kind of guiding you through. Um, I was also struck with how easy it was to find the same or similar tools in order to carry out the work I needed to do. For example, when working in AV, it quickly became just a reflex action to media info a video file, and it even became a verb, like just media info it. Um, it was such a wonderful basic QC step to learn a lot about a video file before you even looked at the content. And now I guess eggs of tool has kind of become my new media info, and occasionally things like Tika or Jove or um, Fitz, which kind of runs them all, but in a kind of outdated way. The main reason that I would use tools like this is to get more granular in metadata, hopefully some embedded descriptive metadata. And I guess it's at its greatest when you're using those reports to populate in an automated way database and catalog records to be able to grab the most relevant pieces of technical or preservation metadata. So I guess when transforming um, these metadata outputs into something more standardized, in the past, I would have worked on or worked with things like PB Core, um, and even made a failed attempt to implement the Ferber esque EN 15907. Um, and while PB Core um, and 15907 didn't really cross over into the general National Library of Ireland's metadata model, it really helped when we had to implement things like METS or NISO MIX uh, for still images. Um, it made like just understanding and adopting those things a lot easier. Um, and I guess when thinking about standards from a file format perspective, I kind of previously would have thought that all the time I would have spent researching the specifications of like DPX, FFV1, Matroska, the whole digital cinema and broadcast spectrum, that all that work kind of just would not be reused. And of course, it, it, the specifics aren't. But I think that the art of like reading and interpreting a standard is a skill in and of itself using whatever tools are at your disposal to verify that the files in your care actually match the specification and also figuring out like the best way to articulate the issue to a donor perhaps, um, why you're rejecting it, uh, how it should be improved. That's very much a transferable skill that works in any realm, I think. Um, assuming that you can actually find the specification in question, um, even if like, uh, I guess the spec can be reverse engineered, like the Canon RAW format, for example. 
So one thing that kind of became clear to me when working with AV was that I felt like um, file format obsolescence didn't really hit AV as much as maybe people thought it might many, many years ago. And I think that this is largely due to the power of FFmpeg, which already decodes and encodes a lot. And if there's a format that it doesn't currently support, um, assuming that you actually have reference files, financial support for the developers, there's probably a good chance that support could be added. Um, the nature of the collections in a nat national library necessitates just a far wider gamut of format types. And the potential, potential issues that can arise can escalate as a result. So um, there isn't exactly an FFmpeg that works for documents exactly. And it appears that maybe emulation is the potential problem solver when thinking about potential migration or access issues. Um, of course, uh, image magic and graphics magic are comparable to FFmpeg, but I think a significant difference, and this could just be ignorance on my part, I'm happy to be corrected, but there's a significant interaction between audiovisual archivists and the FFmpeg community. And there's a lot of crossover, but I'm not sure if something similar exists within those kind of graphic and image magic communities, or at least um, I'm not aware of it. Um, I, I grew so used to using FFmpeg for all sorts of normalizations and migrations and even quality control work, where it would often do a really good job at reporting on internal errors. Um, and I guess now I'm just looking forward into digging into like a variety of tools um, that will hopefully do similar things in the documents and image and other format types. And it won't just be the one tool, unfortunately. Um, it looks like there will, um, yeah, so I got to move on because I'm running close on time. So um, I guess regarding tools and skills to actually implement some of these standards, um, it became quickly apparent to me that being proficient in the use of command line and running scripts, that it's, I think it's really essential. I think I was in such a bubble for so long, I thought that maybe it was definitely essential for the work that I was doing in AV, but I just, I think that like learning how to script and code and that kind of thing, that's definitely a perk that is preferable and it would make your work, I guess, um, a lot more productive and more accurate and stuff. But I do think that becoming proficient with the command line, learning to use different kinds of open source tools is absolutely um, essential, especially when it comes to performing pre ingest activities. And so far, I've written a, a probably at least 10 different like one off bespoke scripts just to help with things like audits, selection, appraisal, uh, even cataloging, arrangement, things like that. It's uh, I'm surprised how useful it has been outside of the AV context. I remember uh, Dave Rice uh, saying before that the, the film archivist has like the splicer and the light box and the rewind table for their workbench. And us digital folks have things like the command line and scripts and open source tools as our workbench. And it's definitely just as true outside of the AV realm. And I guess um, one of the main lessons I've learned here is that even if like your actual repository code base, like your maybe because we have hydrants or slash Sambera, like that's kind of outside of my remit. We have like our, our technical team work on that, but there's always um, going to be pre-ingest and a whole bunch of other things where um, there's scope for investigating with these things. And I just think as any digital archivist or librarian who's um, receiving, preparing, cataloging digital material, being comfortable with this stuff is, I think, really essential. Um, so I guess a lot of my work as well currently involves researching and documenting workflows, like the actual usage of all of these tools. Um, and I think getting active and consistent with documenting procedures and like training other staff on carrying out those procedures, ultimately writing policies, these are all incredibly transferable. And I'm really, really glad that the complexities and difficulties uh, of AV work, it forced me to write campus procedures just to get the work consistent. And that's really stood to me now in the NLI, where my reflex action is just, you know, I learned something about Brunhilde or a bit curator. It's like, okay, let's write a procedure immediately, because I'll forget it as well. I guess, look, as a final aside, um, audiovisual material is probably never far away um, in, in any institution. There's always a little or a lot in every archive or library. I know there's already some born digital AV in some of our collections that have yet to be ingested, and there's going to be a lot more to come. So I guess my message to anyone specifically working in AV who think that it might be difficult, if not impossible, to leave this field into more general uh, digital preservation work, uh, you're probably far more capable than you might think you are. Um, and if your work involves as many standards as possible, you're working with a lot of uh, command line open source tools, you're really digging into writing up procedures and policies, your work is probably a lot more uh, like transferable 
which ultimately benefits you, your career, but it also benefits the institution you're currently working for. And I guess it was probably misleading for me to think that I've left AV in the first place, because I guess regardless of media type, it's all digital files and context at the end of the day, bit streams and headers, data and metadata, using a variety of standards and tools to facilitate their ongoing preservation and access. So I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, cheerio. Thank you so much, Kieran. Um, we don't have any time for questions for this block, but um, happy, I, I, Kieran, I'm sure would be happy to, to chat more in the chat or in Gathertown uh, for later, uh, as long as uh, the power stays on in Ireland. For now. <laughs> um, I heard before we, we kicked this recording off that there was a bit of a storm there that I wasn't aware of. <laughs>